January 19th, 2021. Welcome to the Outlaw Pulpit. And I am so glad you could join me. Um, you know, it, it might have been somewhat predictable as to what, which way I'm going to go given everything that's going on in the United States. But you know what? I'm going to avoid that altogether. Uh, the presidential things, all of that, just not going to even touch it. Um, it's literally uh, darned if you do, darned if you don't when you talk about uh, what's going on in the United States. And so I don't want to use that to be a divisive thing with us. And uh, I really don't feel the need to go down that path. Everybody knows what they believe. And so I'll use something else to be divisive. <laughs> I want to talk about modern worship, uh, modern worship music and uh, the state of it in the church. You know, modern worship is an interesting uh, to say the least, I was raised in a church a denomination. They call themselves a fellowship, uh, the Assemblies of God, and uh, where the norm was foot stomping, hand clapping, and all of these things. And um, honestly, uh, and you expected songs that were um, uplifting, songs that got you going, and uh, they were the 7 Eleven choruses. You know what I mean by that? Seven words repeated 11 times, hope the Holy Spirit shows up. But, you know, actually, I look back on that and I really, really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed that state of worship. Um, now, I was born in 74, so 74 to like 82, 83 is kind of a blur for me. But um, I, I was part of the, uh, and heard a lot of the Hosanna Integrity uh, record label stuff, Maranatha, um, those sort of things. And then <laughs> later in the 90s, things got a little more trendy because Vineyard came out and um, they had Vineyard Cafe, which was uh, nothing more than acoustic style worship. But um, I was raised on the songs by Iris Stanfill, you know, Mansion Over the Hilltop and uh, Doris Aker, Sweet, Sweet Spirit and Bill Gaither. Where do you begin on what songs he sang from him growing up in that era? And it, 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 it seems, though, there have been a shift, in not only in the songs we sing, but what we sing about. And that's what I really wanted to talk about, because this shift in songs and verbiage has, uh, is, I guess, quite concerning. Now, I, I need to backtrack a little bit. I, I got to see this shift happen because um, I was a music buyer for a Christian bookstore, actually three of them. I kept moving up and eventually became the music buyer and dealt with record labels. And that was the onset of like Don Moen, Morris Chapman. And let me just say Morris Chapman was probably the best worship leader on the Maranatha record label. Um, and uh, so many others. And then it started shifting. We started going into like Daryl Evans and um, then Delirious. Remember Delirious? That, that stuff started coming out. And the, the the worship began to 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 shift and we went from songs that said then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art to messages of how we're worms how we're scum how i struggle every morning how i i you see where i'm going with that we we began to go from i guess vertical worship to horizontal worship and we were talking about ourselves and we still do I mean, some of the, the top songs that we sing today in churches um, are all about I, 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 woe is me, woe is me, and all this stuff. And then you get certain groups that sing on a hill and they're a song. I'm not going to say any names, though. Um, they, they release songs like Oceans and um, other songs like that. And they find, there's a scientific method to this, they find what is working musically what drives that because music is very powerful and with the right chords the right riffs and everything matched with ho-hum lyrics um it, it takes you to a place okay this happens with pink floyd this happens with you too this happens with project 86 they hit the right um tone in their guitar piano whatever or if you're trendy, mandolin, um, and match that up with harmonizing vocals, you're taken to a different place. Here is my concern. And I can just say really quick, a lot of the songs that we sing today are, I, I wonder sometimes, it, you know, remember the days when an artist, look at, look at most of your hymns, Fanny Crosby, Ira Stanfill, um, uh, on and on the list goes. One person wrote the song. Today, 
you look at a modern worship song that's big, there's six or seven different artists that have contributed to make this thing happen. That trickles over into sermons, and I'm going to talk about that in weeks to come. But it's almost like you, the, these artists sit down and they take a pen and they make a choose your own adventure. Remember those books? Choose your own adventure using Christian buzzwords. And they are a hit. They are pumped everywhere through every radio station that, are, that plays Christian music. But in Psalms chapter 77, verse 5, we read, Let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. The problems with songs that are laced with low-life verbiage is that they are usually popular. And at the sake of sounding male chauvinist, but it's a fact, in the words of Rush, don't doubt me. (laughs) It is really one of these things where they gear music to moms. They gear worship music to women. Because these are the people that are in the car a lot, typically, not in all cases, typically, and they're running errands, they're they're going to work, they're taking kids everywhere, and life honestly can be quite frantic if you've ever had to do that, whether you're a guy or a girl, okay, a father or a mother, life can be frantic, and so these songs get big, and then they pump them through the, the radio, which everyone's a lot of people are tuned into and they start singing these songs about how we don't measure up, how we don't do this for, you know, on and on it goes. And what happens is when we read the words of Psalm 77 verse five, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. We repeat those songs over and over again within our own mind. And guess what happens? You start, I start, we start believing what we're saying. I am a low life. I don't measure up. I don't, I I can't strive to this. And I'm drowning in the ocean and all of this stuff. And it's, it's a sick mindset. But then it makes you want to, makes these people want to sing that more and more. And just a side note, a lot of them are just theologically crap. And that's the Greek word for garbage, by the way. (laughs) But Romans 8.37 says, No, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And we we negate that fact. We negate the fact of other scriptures that says, If God be for us, who can be against us? It's the classic idea that if you tell someone something long enough, guess what? They're going to start believing it. And so when you fill your head with these sort of modern worship songs, I'm not saying all are bad. There are a lot of good ones. But when you're filling your mind with the ones that are all I, 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 and me, and we, and everything, there's no worship involved there. Praise and worship. That's, what's the, that's what we call it in the church. Not I. No, we don't sing songs like how great I am, how great I, uh, thou art I am. You know, We don't do that. Praise is talking about somebody, singing about somebody, about how awesome they are, how great they are. Worship is praising them, worshiping, using words to express gratitude. That's what praise and worship is. In the realm of modern worship, it really can be quite disturbing. Think about what we call that time of worship again. It's praise and worship. Are we able to take a song that's praise and worship, and really classified as that. Personally, songs that lift up the name of Jesus and the awesomeness of God are really the ones that people need to sing and enter into worship. Why do you think a simple song like Jesus Loves Me, This I Know is so popular? Because it's a song to Jesus. It's really quite simple. Why, why, do we, why, why do we look back in the 90s and we look at a song like, Lord, I Lift Your Name on High? Why was that song such a smashing success? Because of the very first couple of words, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth. So on and on it goes. You get my drift? Modern worship can be very disturbing. Use discretion when you're choosing songs, when you're singing songs, when you're believing the stuff. You know, there's there's one group that sings, Living He Loved Me, Dying He Saved Me. And I'm not saying anything bad about the group. It's 
there there's there's truth in those lines but i would much rather youtube the donnie mcclurkin version and celebrate that song as living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried all my sins far away rising he justified freed me forever one day he's coming back glorious day and if you listen to the donnie mcclurkin version of that song there's no comparison all right time for i didn't think you had it in you i'm your huckleberry this question is coming from rachel she says so thank you again for your reassurance i was wondering if you could answer a question on the process of forgiveness when christians cause you pain now that <laughs> i can offer you some help on this christians can be very good at causing pain i've done it other people have done it unintentionally intentionally these things happen i oftentimes say the church the slogan for any church should be welcome to first assembly of god we're sorry the reason being is that if you stick around a church long enough, you're going to get hurt by it. Somebody's going to say something stupid. Something's going to happen and you're going to get hurt. Or you're going to say something that's not right and you're going to hurt other people. Let me talk about something just a little deeper though. I was eight years into a youth pastorate in Milwaukee. That was my first youth pastor position. I've only served two places. Eight years in Milwaukee and 16 years where I'm currently at. But at the end of the eight years, I was severely burned. I was severely let down. The pastor had a moral failing. He had to leave. And the board took it as their opportunity to, be, to start power tripping on me and wrangle, tried to wrangle me in. And I ended up resigning. It just wasn't a good situation. They took a youth group of 85 kids in a church of 80 down to 12 in a matter of two weeks. I was livid. And... I'll be honest with you. There was a lot of hurtful words there. The last message I got to share that on that my last Sunday there had to be board approved in order for me to share that. Think about that for a minute. It had to be board approved. It wasn't a good situation. And so I went into my next ministerial position as lead pastor of the church I'm at. But I blogged about that situation. I taught on how to survive church abuse. I so many things at Cornerstone Festival, Life Fest, and uh, writ, wrote two books about it. And it honestly took me six or seven years to finally get over it. I found forgiveness in some of the things they said to me. I found some satisfaction in some of the things that, that took place. And to be honest with you, I reached out to a few of them as well and offered my apologies as well for the attitude I carried regarding how they treated me. I didn't need to do that, but I, I did need to do that. You know what I'm saying? And so when I got the replies back saying, we forgive you, um, a couple said, do you forgive us? And it, it, we made amends. But being hurt by other Christians, uh, I hate to say it, it's to be expected. There you go. It's to be expected. We're not proud of it. We don't want to do it, but sometimes it happens. And so what you do is you move on. You say, okay, that's your opinion. If you have the opportunity to move on out of a church, then that's if you need to do that, that's what you need to do. But at the end of the day, you offer forgiveness. And you ask for forgiveness. You say, I forgive you for what you've done. But then you ask for forgiveness too because it's a two-way street and you say, I'm sorry for thinking the things I did of you. And forgiveness doesn't mean I'm going to go hang out with these people again. Forgiveness doesn't mean I'm going to drive to Milwaukee now two hours south and take them out for dinner and, hey, everything's fine. No, I probably won't hang out with them ever again. But the fact is we got things right. We set it straight and we move on. And if you reach your hand out and they slap it away, that's on them. There is a little story in scripture that say dust your heels off and walk away from it. So there you go. If you have a question you want me to address on I'm Your Huckleberry, then send it over to outlawpulpit at gmail.com. I'll do my best to reply. And I uh, look forward to being with you again next week. Have a good one.